This is Between the Brackets, a Media Wiki podcast, episode 32, April 16th, 2019. Welcome to Between the Brackets. I'm your own Koren. Uh, and my guest for this episode is Lex Sulzer, who runs the consulting company DataSpect. Lex was planned to be my first ever live interview because last week we were both in Daly City, California for the Enterprise Media Wiki conference. And we were both there a few days early, so I figured it was the perfect opportunity to do an in-person Between the Brackets. Uh, but as tends to happen, time just ran out. Anyway, we're both back home now, a little better rested. Um, <clears throat> Thankfully, my voice has recovered somewhat um, and ready to just do a regular interview. So, Lex, welcome to the program. Yeah, welcome. Um, where are you located? I'm located in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, in, in the town of Zurich. Yeah, great. Um, I think I first met you four years ago at the SMW Con in Barcelona, Spain, Um at that point, you were working for a company called Linux Competence Center. Um, what were you doing before you got into MediaWiki stuff? Well, actually, um, always software related, but uh, not in development or so, much more in the uh, knowledge management part of medical companies and also a maritime software uh, developer and supplier. Uh, but I soon recognized the immense value that uh, MediaWiki would you know, bring to knowledge management. And then at some point I got so hooked up with uh, developing and programming that I thought, well, let's concentrate on that aspect of a, of a company. So knowledge management and uh, media wiki. Yeah. That was while you were still working for uh, Linux competence center. Uh, well, yeah. The, the reason why I joined Linux competence center was because I wasn't really knowledgeable in the infrastructure part. And in in Europe, you have to understand that businesses are very reluctant to putting their uh, data in the cloud. Uh, I understand that in, in the U.S. that's different. Uh, you know, right. companies would trust their uh, cloud providers to host their sensitive data. But that's not so much the case in Europe. We're more conservative there. So that means if you supply a media wiki to a company, it means that you have to set it up within their uh, networks on their premises. And of course, uh, you know, a lot of uh, IT departments are not very keen on preparing everything for you. So you would have to actually bring everything yourself. Uh, and nowadays I have already uh, also dockerized everything. But at that time, I was looking for a strategic business partner that could help me with, with the infrastructure part while I was actually concentrating on setting up MediaWiki with uh, the pertinent extensions and especially uh, the ontology part. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll get into uh, we'll get into ont ontology stuff later. Um, um, d uh, just out of curiosity, do you still do any work for Linux Competence Center? Uh, sometimes they relay customers uh, to me. But uh, like that, um, I have yeah. matured and can handle all the infrastructure part now uh, myself. So I'm I'm not yeah. dependent on them anymore. But uh, of course, you know they they hand me over customers that they are they they don't want to handle because of uh, the ex they don't have the expertise in media wiki as I have nowadays. Yeah. Um. So now you run a consulting company called DataSpects. Uh. When did you create that? That was in uh, September 2017. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's about two years old. Yeah. Well, yeah, a year and a half, maybe. Yeah, a year and um, a half. Right? Yeah. Um, and everything you do with data specs is MediaWiki related? Um, no, not everything, because I sort of moved my focus from MediaWiki centric to search centric and the reason behind that is because of course companies run uh, you know multiple resource silos uh, that serve as natural habitats for information and of course all information represents knowledge ultimately uh, and then I'm not a big fan of moving everything into MediaWiki uh, I think you know there's pertinent specialized applications for data I mean you imagine a, an accounting system 
or a sure, ticketing yeah. <laughs> system or a CRM, an ERP. Uh, the reason, the, the, the goal is not to move everything to MediaWiki, uh, but MediaWiki plays a very important role as a very versatile, let's say, Swiss army knife application because... Uh, you know, the information, uh, the example I brought forward uh, uh, in San Francisco is sometimes you've got knowledge scattered uh, across several silos in a company. Uh, let's imagine you have a nail, a hammer and a piece of wood. Uh, with the nail, you have precautionary uh, explanations or notice notices. And with a nail, you have uh, sorry, with a hammer, you have an, uh, an instruction manual. And a piece of wood would sort of be accompanied by a uh, description of uh, of the wood and, and its characteristics. However, there is no part uh, in these documents that would explain how to turn these three things into a chair. So you would have you would need an additional document to write down how to combine all these three things into a chair and how to uh, how to do that. So and then of course uh, many people or many companies turn to Word files. This is uh, still the uh, sure. main uh, tool, uh, but of course we we know uh, that that is uh, not ideal for many reasons, and of course that's where MediaWiki uh, plays out its its strength. Uh, so that's one thing, and the other thing is the amazing capability of prototyping. So if you take uh, a classic right. MediaWiki and extend it with uh, Cargo or Semantic Media Wiki, you have a toolbox at hand that allows you to create, you know, let's say rudimentary applications, but you've got them up and running after half an hour uh, that would serve one of your business domain needs before you might change to a specialized um, application uh, for that purpose. So that is that is unique uh, with Semantic Media Wiki, especially because of all the templating that you can do and like that. You have components that you can reuse and uh, deploy at several customers, so you you save their development work. Um, yeah. So, but to come back to your original yeah. question, I have really turned to to focus on search, but uh, everything revolves around the Media Wiki. Um, for uh, for supporting uh, tying in several uh, pieces of information that are scattered a across uh, several resource silos. Yeah, um, yeah. Just uh, it, it's interesting. A few things you said. Um, yeah, that word prototyping or rapid prototyping or the concept seems to uh, come up uh, pretty regularly on this podcast. It's it's something people really like about MediaWiki. I. I I never bring it up when trying to sell the software, although I, I guess I should because it's a popular thing. I mean, I mean, it sort of implies that it's you know just a draft version, and then and then you move your data into some real thing. Which I mean, depending on the data, the type that may or may not be the best thing to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you know, many people who are mm -hmm. not really experienced with software development, they tend to. Over to to come up with overly complex solutions, right? Uh, and and a semantic media wiki, or or f you know, including your page forms and and cargo, allow you to come up with a with a working, you know, you could call it a prototype at the beginning, but then using it might turn out that that is actually enough, and good yeah. enough is good enough, right? Right. <laughs> That's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. And specifically, you mentioned CRM and ERP, you know, um, yeah, that's the, I guess the long term goal is to get all the software to, to be functional enough that it really could replace, uh, it, it doesn't matter whether people know what CRM and ERP or whatever it is. It's just, you know, different kinds of, uh, uh, applications, but, um, you know, to get MediaWiki to really fill in all the functionality. Exactly. I mean, I can give you one one uh, example that is very current, and that is uh, in view of the fact that we're going to organize the SMWCon 2019 fall in Paris. Uh, of course, we eat. Our oh, whoa, boxes. whoa! Hold on, hold on! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hey, uh, that's this is a, a, a between the brackets exclusive here. I don't think this has uh, been publicized yet. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll get we'll, okay. Fantastic. We'll, we'll we'll get to that. Table that thought. But uh, okay. Yeah, you, no, I I was just bringing that up uh, to let yeah, you know. Yeah, go ahead. That, go ahead. But that's uh, well, uh, that's great to yeah, hear. Yeah, yeah. The, the okay. idea the idea is that uh, that's a special domain. So organizing a conference 
uh, you've got it's it's a special domain that has many entity types and things you have to take care of um, that are very characteristic for a conference. So I have come up with a conference management ontology that is, by the way, uh, you can look oh, at that. It's it, it's public on my GitHub uh, account and it's called conference management ontology that cool. consists of uh, the entity types. So you've got talks and participants and locations and events and venues and everything and the uh, corresponding uh, properties that link up all these things. So that's what I refer to as an ontology. Uh, and that ontology is then put on top of a media wiki. Right. And it allows us to, it ha yeah, to have a domain-specific ontology on a media wiki that is optimized for managing um, a conference organization. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it has a, 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 a I'm sure, a, a, a bunch of advantages even over dedicated conference management systems. Um, well, to be very honest, I haven't investigated uh, these, but um, oh, okay. yeah, let's this, say, this, yeah, yeah, that would be that would be a good example if if that um, ontology that I'm talking about now turns out not to be enough. Of course, you could move everything out into a new system, and there you have another ex advantage with MediaWiki because of the open data uh, connectivity. True. So you can yeah. you can you know export everything to JSON, XML, CSV, whatever, right, and right. import it there. But I'm very confident that um, this setup that we have now would be enough, and everybody would sure. be happy uh, to use that system exclusively without right. extending it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but just, I mean, the, I, well, I don't know much about conference management systems specifically. There's something called Easy Chair, but uh, um, yeah, just okay. in terms of the fact that it's a wiki and so it's publicly it, it, editable by anyone, it, I mean, you, you really can't duplicate that functionality in in uh, some in some non-wiki software. That's yeah. a big. That's a big thing, really. Yeah. There you go. Um, um, <clears throat> so okay, so that th that was like a a detour of a detour, but um, um, getting back to uh, to well to to uh, your work. Um, uh, so uh, you know, I've heard quite a bit from you at, at, at uh, from talks uh, and and just talking to you uh, about the technical aspects of what you do um, and I definitely want to get into all that but one thing I don't think I've ever heard you talk about is the actual business side of things um, without necessarily getting to specifics what kind of clients have you had uh, hospitals um, then like uh, I mean service providers like printing services uh, service providers and a couple of, um, of how do I say, um, uh, you know, uh, bits, um, how do you say, um, what's what's the English word for uh, government, like government agencies, right? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That uh, that of course have a lot of information to catalog and everything, so uh, they turn to open source for cost reasons. Um, so these were the three types of businesses that are that are my main uh, playground at the moment yeah uh cool and mostly in switzerland uh yes at the moment yes there's one in germany but uh, all the others are uh, are in switzerland at the moment yeah yeah um how do you find clients or do they find you well that's that's a, that's an amazing thing actually uh my conference talks have a lot of effect there uh i have to i can i'm very you know comfortable to say that all my clients that i have received so far and you know since i'm alone i'm quite happy with two or three to handle now since i'm still in a you know development phase uh so that right. is enough for my uh, capabilities that I can bear every day, but yeah, no, they have uh, found my YouTube talks at all the oh, conferences, wow. and then and then called me up. So that's why the conferences that you guys organize in in the states and and your European colleagues in in Europe, uh, they s also serve as a as a linking pin to new customers for me. So it's it's fantastic. Wow, that's great. Wow, I yeah, I had no idea actually. Um... Uh, cool. Maybe uh, this podcast will uh, will get will find you some more clients too. We'll see if you can handle any more at this point. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, you know, the the main goal is really to bring down marginal cost in terms of um, deployment at customers close to zero. And then right. you can really take care of all the specialities that come up. Um, and I'm, I'm yeah. pretty uh, close there. But of course, still, you have to polish things out. So we're in that process now. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's a good segue, actually, to talking about the, 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 the technical aspects of what you're doing. Um, to me, uh, I think the most interesting thing is, uh, is the use of a search engine uh, to allow for searching across a lot of different data sources, uh, both wiki and otherwise within an organization, which is uh, you could call a form of enterprise integration. Um, exactly. If, if I'm using that term. Okay. Um, could you talk about that? Um, well, remember then when Google had its desktop search, uh, you know, in, in right. their offers until about two years ago, I think, three years ago. Oh, I didn't know they, and, uh, I didn't know they stopped. They stopped and the rumors I heard, I do not know whether that is true, but I, I heard those rumors that Larry Page sort of dumped all projects that wouldn't come up with at least 100 million potential customers, uh, which I is, see. of course, amazing. But uh, this serves <laughs> us well because a lot of companies, of course, there's not a market with 100 million customers there, but still, um, you know, right. The uh, every employee is is used to using search engines, especially on the quality level of Google outside his or her workplace. Uh, so of course they would question whether or why they couldn't have that within their companies as well. Um, sure. And you know the saying that if there's no competitor, there's probably no market. Uh, there's a lot of little companies, or you know, larger and smaller. For example, Swisscom. Uh, so this is the uh, Swiss main telecommunication provider has launched its own uh, corporate search uh, for businesses. And so, yeah, that would be um, one of my competitors. I'm not sure whether they are that much into the semantics part as, as I am. Oh, okay. But um, yeah, so that's why um, I think it's a promise in market. Yeah. So... So you use MediaWiki and specifically Semantic MediaWiki to um, to to handle the search. I guess you're using it to store all the information, like the settings. I guess to to get search running well, like what the important keywords are and that kind of thing. Um, well, I've got several indexer classes written for different resource silos. So you've got email accounts, uh, CRMs, ERPs, file systems, MediaWiki, and everything. Uh, but at some point, of course, I want to introduce semantics uh, because of synonym management, like say hyponym, hy hyponym and everything. So this whole thesaurus uh, right. aspects. And at some point, you have to specify that. And of course, there's specialized tools for that, like Apache Gina and uh, Neo4j, uh, Protege and everything. But those are really complex. And since I want to make sure that, um, you know, more or less ordinary power users at a customers can handle these systems, I started using Semantic Media Wiki for administering those properties and annotations and predicates. Uh, so you're right. I'm using Semantic Media Wiki for that part uh, where semantics really play a big role. Uh, and then the other thing is when, you know, a lot of data is so structured that that actually deserves its own database, uh, but there's no specialized structure for that. And of course, if you use PHP, my admin and everything like that for, uh, for relational data management, that's, that already needs the passion of a, of a coder. And that's, so I want to move that into MediaWiki right. as well. And that's where your uh, extension cargo uh, plays the pivotal role because it's a perfect oh. interface to to the relational data. Uh, so when it when it comes to you know specialized semantics, I turn to Semantic Media Wiki, and if it's purely or mainly relational, I stick with Cargo. And a good cool. example for Cargo application would be uh, terminology management, where you just have you know, strict relationships between hypernyms, hyponyms, synonyms, and antonyms. Uh, that doesn't need to be represented in a 
semantic web, but can be stored in a very clear, uh, you know, down to earth uh, um, relational database. So yeah, these are the two main components. And then of course your forms yeah. uh, that are uh, a, a very important part of uh, of managing it. Cool, cool. Um, so how does it work in in practice? Uh, you know, integrating all. Um, different systems into the search i mean uh you know you come into to some organization they have you know any potentially any set of applications that store data how how do you uh get everything to uh to be searchable together okay uh so this is uh, to all the listeners if you go to dataspects.com you will see a diagram under the title of at the core search across all your information so there i've got a layout of the basic architecture uh, so first i would you know visit the customer and ask him which resource silos are most important uh, for him you know you start small you don't roll out a whole waterfall oriented project at the beginning but you start with a with a little mvp minimum viable product uh, so these would be the resource silos. And then I write feeders. That means, for example, with an email system or a file system uh, that would collect uh, the files or the emails out of that account or or folder structure. And then the first level is everything is put into a MongoDB. That's because when I ah. re-index, uh, I don't want to have to go back to the original resource silo, which might be very expensive. Uh, and put a strain on the customer system that you uh, that we want to avoid. Uh, also, MongoDB is uh, can be sharded out horizontally without losing any exactness of search results, which is something that um, Elasticsearch cannot guarantee. So we've got a middle layer of MongoDB, and then from MongoDB, when you've got uh, the data in a as raw as possible format. Uh, so, for example, for file, we send everything to Tika, which is a parsing uh, service that just, you know, scrapes out every single last bit of text out of any file you supply it to. And then we store that. And after that, we write an indexer. So that would be the red part in that diagram uh, that actually analyzes what's in there and feeds it to a... Uh, canonical index and by canonical I mean and now I'm, I'm not sure whether we're getting too complex here um, but <laughs> you know behind the scenes we've got the EPO um, paradigm which means that we organize knowledge into entity types so you've got for example in my maybe that's that gets a little well, bit ahead of uh, ahead of the talk uh yeah, we can talk about uh, EPO E P P O every page is page one. Uh if that's what you're talking about. Yes, yes. Um yeah, I mean the idea there is is uh you know, people should people should be able to understand everything by by going to every page. It's not, you know, you shouldn't be able have to see everything with a, within the context of some other pages or something. Exactly, exactly. Um yeah, so how does that relate to this whole search thing? Um, well, if you if you go to my ui.dataspects.com and you click on go to search, you will see my current ontology uh, of the domain I'm dealing with. And of course, I'm 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 about my business is about, you know, setting up search and media wiki. And by that I I I take care and I deal with a lot of entities and their relationships um, and the goal is that we index any resource silo in a way that breaks it down to those entity types and how they relate so that makes everything comparable they all end up in the in the same index so the the way that yeah. uh, distributed data is represented in the search engine is not dependent on the source. Everything will end up in the same way, and that's why everything is then searchable in the same way. And also, semant you know, can can be turned into into a semantic web. 
But that's maybe something I would have to explain with a uh, with a concrete example at hand. Well, I think I understand. The idea is it really is like having Google for all of your your uh, data, even the stuff that that's not really web pages, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. It, it all it um so in in that sense it's not even every page is page one it's like it's every every um data record is a web page <laughs> yes exactly i mean you know when you in a media wiki when you've got pages i uh, prefix the page name with the type so let's say one page could oh, uh, yeah, right, right. represent a recipe Another page could represent uh, information about an ontology, uh, about a user, and so on. And these are the what I call entity types. Uh, so when when your brain gets, you know, con confronted with this piece of information, you can already relate or identify what you're actually looking at. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's that's at the that's at the uh, at the core of the system. Um, right, but that's just for the for the. So there's still something I'm not sure I understand. That's for the wiki, but let's say you're uh, you're accessing uh, your you do the search and you find some data uh, in your CRM or whatever it is you're using. Yes. I don't know, uh, sugar CRM or something. How, um, how does the does the search engine help once you click on that and you get to uh, get to the actual CRM? Yes, and actually, let me give you another example. If I sent you an email with the meeting minutes about uh, some meeting we had, of course, the resource type of that information is an email because it's 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 contained in an email. But that doesn't right. mean that the that the title of the search result that would turn up on a in a search engine needs to be email. But it's much rather a meeting minutes. So sure. we would have to apply some. You know, either it's explicitly tagged or specified, let's say, in the subject line where you say meeting minutes, colon, and then some title. And the indexing process would pick up that email subject line and type it accordingly. But much more promising is an approach where you've got machine learning that would figure out that the nature of the information contained in that email is about meeting minutes or is meeting minutes about a meeting and then it would when it uh, when it indexes that email into a search index or when it places it into a search index it would set that entity type to meeting minutes although the resource type is still email um do you understand right. what i mean there yeah, no uh, yeah sure absolutely you're, okay. you're differentiating the content from the from the medium or something, I guess. Exactly, and uh, you know, if we if we talk about and, and now that was an example of a of a pay of a of an email, but let's go back to a media wiki page where, in the trivial case, of course, the resource type, which is the um, the media wiki page, is also the entity type. So you just say this is a page on my wiki. However, right. we could entitize, if I can use that word, I'm not sure whether that <laughs> exists in, in English, but let's say, you know, sure, use sure. the poet's license here. Uh, let's right. say you have a media wiki page with several sections about many aspects of the, of the nature of the thing that, that you're actually communicating on this page. Then yeah. the indexing process can split that single media wiki page into several entities that would be right. returned individually as individual search results in a, in a search engine. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So even in a wiki, it's not necessarily one-to-one -one that a, a, pay, a wiki page uh, yeah. is, a, is a record. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Let's say in nine, nine out of 10 cases, that's the case. But uh, for example, if a, pay, if a media wiki page has an attachment, like a file, that file, oh, of course, is a different entity than the page itself and would turn up uh, individually. But the indexing process would then uh, record or, or you know, safeguard that relationship by placing a, an annotation on both entities. And when you look at the search results, that link would turn up. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes, uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, you mentioned Elasticsearch. That's a very popular uh, open source search engine. Is that what you always use? 
Um, I system? started, yeah, I started with solar. Um, but to be honest, I thought Elasticsearch was a lot simpler to use and I, li I like simple things. And uh, so I stuck with Elasticsearch ever since. And, uh, you know, they've got a wonderful tool, Kibana, uh, for, uh, and, you know, customers like flashy, colorful bar charts and pie charts and everything. And that is super easy to do uh, with Elasticsearch. And then you've got also the Elk stack, which is Logstash, it's, or it adds Logstash that allows you to visualize Apache logs and MongoDB logs and everything uh, more or less out of the box. So it's a very powerful software that um, I appreciate a lot. Yep. Oh, cool. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, how, how long does it take to, uh, to, to set up something like this for an organization? Um, um, cause you, I, I, every part of it doing the ontologies and the, the, the source and uh, and all of the the integration everything well okay now that sounds a little fantastic but to be very honest the, the the most cumbersome part of setting up a prototype system at a customer premises is to figure out um that company's domain ontology uh, at the outset you know for example a meeting minutes ontology is is probably among the the simplest ones to set up right uh, but once once that customer is sort of and you know my, my goal is to really come up with an with an mvp you know, so a minimum viable product uh, and it should be minimum because you're scaring a lot of people when you bring in uh, such a new system so you right, have to be very right, gentle with uh, especially with the uh, it department i think we all know that um yeah so once once that is done I can deploy the entire infrastructure on a, for example, virtual machine. So I bring my own laptop that is powerful enough to do that. And we try it out. So in the ideal case, let's say two hours after sitting together and coming up with a domain ontology, uh, the customer and uh, their users can really have a, a first uh, interaction with the system and, and, and a touch and feel experience wow. and then you actually just copy the um the virtual machine onto a usb stick and leave it with them and say well now play around and hopefully they get the taste of it and will then call you back and say well can we add this and can we add that and i say of course you can okay wow that's amazing two <laughs> i thought you were going to say a few weeks or something but <laughs> no 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 that's exact of course you know if you, until you have a fully fledged system that that really takes over some some of the heavy burden of course that takes longer but what's right. important is to to give a, a first glimpse very yeah. very early and, and yeah. i can really do that let's say certainly on the first day um of yeah. course then all that ontology part and so on is 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 confined to what to the standards that i have but um, oh, sure, sure. I try I try to keep things you know as standardized as possible, and then we can spend a lot of time on on the special effects for uh, for certain customers. Yeah, yeah, that's a I, I guess a, a far cry from you know the the major consulting companies who uh, I I don't know IBM or whoever else who show up and and you know it's like a six month uh, deployment or something and lots of. Uh, proposals generated and all that kind of stuff um, to do any kind of uh, enterprise well, integration work. Yeah, exactly. I don't know about it's six just, months. You but, have uh, to, well, th that yeah. is, um, yeah, many, many times, of course, that was, I, I have experienced that as well, but um, it's very trust building when you have someone sure. turning up and, and after, let's say, half a day, you can look at something that is still standardized and maybe not, you know, decorated with all your your particularities, but at least you can you can try it out. It's like, you know, a car salesman bringing up the car in two hours and you can have a first test drive. You say, it's not my color, it's not the size, it's not, but it, I got the feeling of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. That's the way to go. Iteration. Fail um, early. That's the 
<laughs> that's the the you have to fail early because otherwise the correction cost is just immense. Yeah, yeah, right. You you will fail one way or the other, so you might as well do exactly. it right away. Yeah, um, that's right. Um, um. So as as far as your actual wiki setup, the really notable thing about it to me is all the automation you do. Um, first of all, you, I know you use Docker to do all the software installation, which is a popular approach these days. Uh, we actually talked about automation uh, in this po podcast in the episode with the NASA guys since they develop a program called Meza, which lets you install MediaWiki and its extensions. Um, I think Visual Editor and Elasticsearch, which we've talked about, are the two big MediaWiki extensions that that's a big deal for. Uh, although the MediaWiki extension is called Cirrus Search, I think, but it's it's actually Elasticsearch. Um, they're both pretty difficult to install uh, on on their own, so that's a big help. Um, but in your case, you go a step beyond that because it's not just MediaWiki code that gets installed automatically, but also you know Linux, Apache, etc. The whole environment. Um, what's the advantage of reinstalling everything every time? Um, well, one of the main ideas behind Docker is that there is no difference uh, between a production setup and a development setup. So you don't end up with these um, cases where the developer says, well, it worked on my machine. You know, that's always a, right. a challenge. So, uh, and then you split up the system into services because essentially Docker is a, a process wrapper. Uh, so the idea is not to put the entire media wiki into a container, although you could do that, and there might be some r rather rare cases where that would make sense. But in general, uh, for example, in, in my system, the minimum amount of uh, Docker containers you use is Apache, uh, one MySQL or MariaDB, MariaDB containers, and then of course uh, Parsoid. So that would be the the minimum. Uh, containers that you would run, and the idea right. is actually pa Parsoid that is the thing that uh, is the service that Visual Ed uh, Visual Editor uh, uses. Just exactly, for people who don't exactly. Know. Yeah. And uh, the idea is that the underlying operating system has nothing more installed than Docker Compose and Docker. So when you do, for example, on Ubuntu, you do apt update and apt upgrade. The only uh, packages apart from, of course, the core OS packages that get touched are uh, Docker Compose and Docker. Everything else is put into a container uh, that you can move around. Um, and also, if you if you have a, a customer's system developed on on your local machine and then move it to the customer, if you just move uh, all the Docker volumes, and by that uh, we mean the customer's data that is pers uh, persistent. So that would be all the database files, the indexes, and the um, media wiki core and extension files and customer data. Uh, so if you move those volumes, which are essentially folders, onto the customer's machine and uh, the corresponding containers and you know start them up uh, using a, a file that wires them together, which is in fact a Docker Compose file, you can be 99.9% .9 sure that everything will work as it did on your own machine. Yeah, sure. Um, do, do you have some kind of master Docker image, I guess it's called, or is it uh, different for different projects? No, it's different for each service uh, you provide. So if you go to, uh, if you look at my data specs uh, account on Docker Hub, uh, you'll see that um, there are some some containers, everything that is not private for my company at the moment. And if you click on those, you can see what's so-called Docker files, which are essentially the DNA of uh, of such a service. And there you can see how you know what gets installed, and um, and that's it. Yeah. So there is no basic container actually. Um, every container has a basic. In, well, they call it layer without going into details there, but let's say you can have a, an empty or a basic Ubuntu container and then you add whatever you want on top of that. Although with uh, Docker, it's more alpine because you want a very thin uh, operating system layer before you add your own stuff. Um, yes, that would be more or less. Yeah, wait, uh, what's that? Word? What, what does alpine mean? 
Alpine is an is a type of Linux that is extremely oh, okay. uh, thin. Yeah. So whereas Ubuntu, the Ubuntu core is maybe a couple of dozens of megabytes, uh, the Alpine core is I think four to five megabytes or what, or, or even smaller. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. But but that means that a lot of tools that you normally use uh, are not available. But you don't. Yeah. You don't actually. Need right. Them. Yeah. You're just running PHP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And well, and no JS, I guess. Um, uh, so that's interesting. I didn't know you had released all of these. I actually I didn't know about Docker Hub either, although I can guess what that is. But um, um, so it, it, is the so can anyone use the images if, that you've created? Yeah, actually, I, 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 I'm I glad you asked because we had a discussion with uh, James Montalbo from NASA uh, yeah. And with uh, Greg Runlet, who um, manages uh, Quality Box, and we've got Blue Spice, you know, Hollow yeah. Veil, who, who also, you know, have wiki installers. And my goal is actually to share one type of Apache container and one type of MySQL and one type of, of a Parsuite container that we all use. Uh, and I think the yeah. first step would be between uh, James and myself to figure that out. Uh, how you know, I I have my Apache container as a suggestion, and it is now up to him to let me know whether he's happy with that one or whether he suggests something else. But the idea is to have one single canonical Apache container that can be used among all let's say wiki providers in our community so that we share those experiences and best practices and insights and have actually move that docker image that's how you instant or where you instantiate the docker container from uh, move to a new docker hub account which we would call for example media wiki stakeholders group or mw stake so that whoever wants to join our community as a media wiki provider could tap into that set of best practices, uh, not only in terms of instructions, but in terms of uh, concrete uh, components as well. Yeah. So, I mean, the plan is to have it under, it, it doesn't have to be under the MediaWiki stakeholders group umbrella, but I, I guess there's advantages to doing that. But wh whatever. I mean, it could be right. MediaWiki, you know, just the community. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like right now it's on my <clears throat> own account, but uh, that's not, you know, it doesn't need to be like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that potentially the Wikimedia Foundation could be interested in as well, at least publicizing or, you know, um, making that the, the standard or something for people who want that kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, cool. Uh, but people can already use it now if they go to Docker Hub? Uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, they can look that up there, and I think I've got it. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have it on my web. Ah, oh, yeah, there. I think there is. No, I okay. would have to put the link on data specs. But you would you would find okay. it if you well, look for data specs on um, on Docker Hub. Okay, yeah, I'll have a link to it on the uh, the the podcast episode page. Uh, okay, the other links. Um. <clears throat> So you do another kind of automation, which is automation of the data structures on the wiki, uh, templates, forms, etc. Yes. Um, uh, that's pretty cool, too. Uh, from what I understand, you use a lot of helper templates. Uh, so if, if two forms are, you know, 90% the same, then you, you use a bunch of mini templates that together store all the parts that are identical. And then the only thing in the form definitions is the little bit that's different. Uh, is that exactly. basically correct? Okay. Absolutely. Um, you'll see on my GitHub uh, account, there's uh, the data specs system core ontology. And the goal there is that, uh, you know, always paying tribute to the EPO ontology where you've got entity types and you manage them. Uh, I have a basic form template that reuses as many elements as possible. So we have the form header and form footer are uh, template calls and also the form standard sections and the only thing you have to add is actually one of uh, the fields and the um, the label of the fields 
uh, and that is it. Everything else is reused. Uh, also on the other side, of course, you've got the template for that entity type. So if, let's say, the entity type diagram has a form and has a template, uh, both templates and uh, both the template and the form are so abstracted that the only thing you have to add is the properties because that's the only thing yeah. that changes right yeah it's pretty cool i mean um i'm always interested i interested in trying to simplify the whole setup with uh templates and forms and everything else uh, i cuz it's it, it's unnecessarily complicated unnecessarily complicated right now i, I, I I agree with that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the ideal way to do it uh, is. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about a, a Lua recently, uh, you know, the, the Scribunto extension uh, as potentially a way to do something similar to what you're doing. Well, I'm glad you say that because I'm I'm more than willing to cooperate with you to, to move that to Lua. I'm using Lua for... We don't have to go into details here, but to bidirectional properties, uh, you see that, that they are queryable from both sides uh, without having to actually specify them on both sides of a uh, semantic relationship. Um, but oh, okay. my goal was actually to, because Lua is, um, of course, is a little more complex than pure wiki text uh, for right. a lot of people. So I thought, let's start with the with the means that we have at hand without actually, you know, diverting to Lua. But especially now, if we, if we can observe that people are happy with that setup and find it useful, uh, you know, it would have calmed down in terms of uh, development oscillations. We could actually sit together and flesh these things out to Lua templates that would, of course, add additional flexibility and abstraction possibilities that would that would greatly you know simplify things so i'm more than uh, yeah. more than happy to look into that with you okay cool great um yeah let's do it uh uh yeah okay we'll talk about it offline i guess but uh, sure, uh sure. yeah it'd be cool e either well yeah yeah um uh, either at a conference or before then, but ideally before then, I guess, because we won't have well, time. Well, I'd say, you know, if, if at a conference we find time, because there are certainly other people who would be That's true. Uh, having, that, that would have contributions to make. So we could have a, a workshop where yeah. we say, you know, uh, abstract, uh, you know, reused elements for forms and templates uh, in a Lua paradigm. Uh, yeah, that would be very exciting and very useful, I have to say. Yeah, I'm really I I I have I've barely used Lua, but I really appreciate it uh as a concept and I want to start using it. Um uh yeah, I mean obviously WikiText is just easier to use cuz it's right there and and uh, everybody knows the syntax already. Well, very few people know the syntax, but it, but everybody in our world, I guess. Um Exactly. Uh but yeah, it's, at some point pretty quickly you the the complexity of of dealing with wiki text and like nested template calls and everything else it starts to outweigh the uh the ease of use. Uh Yes, for example, I I have quite some fields that I want to trickle down a, a template cascade. And of course, you have to you know the scope of a variable or the scope of a field in a template is confined to that template call. So I have to repeat um, those template calls when I go down a two, three layer uh, of cascading template calls. And, and if that all of that can be avoided, of course, you know, you could really turn to an object oriented approach. And sure. as I said, uh, as soon as we have figured out how the system is mostly appreciated and, and people are happy with it, and, and then let's let's tackle that task. Yeah, yeah. Object not to not to dwell on this <laughs> too much, but object oriented impl implying. Uh, well, I, I guess a big thing is inheritance, where you can have a, a class uh, exactly that, that that's like another class, but just with one new, one one additional field or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Cool, cool. Well, um, great. We've got uh, uh, at, at least one uh, productive thing coming out of this uh, talk. Although I think I, I mean I think learning about all this is quite productive too. Um, sure. So 
Uh, yeah, so you you actually, I, I, I wanted to save it to the end while we're talking now uh, uh, about it, but uh, you, you dropped early on the, uh, the, the, the bombshell, I guess, that uh, an, there's a, a, a new uh, conference uh, planned for, uh, for this fall in Europe. Um, uh, what can you say about it? Well, well, as you said, you know, it's not completely confirmed yet, so let's keep it low. But uh, someone from Europe uh, approached us, and there, I, uh, by us, I mean the MW Stake uh, holder group members, uh, and oh, said, I "Well, okay. I, I, I propose to host the conference in Paris uh, this fall, and we want to follow up on that. And uh, we are right now in the uh, discussions and." probably will be able to disclose further information let's say i'd say within the month of april okay fantastic that's great um yeah we've never had a conference in france before that but that'll be uh really cool and there's certainly i think a growing interest in france it's not just confined to you know germany and uh and the netherlands and uh and thereabouts exactly uh so um and and you uh, you're you're going to be one of the planners the uh, you know somewhere in the, uh, in the committee. Well, you know, be uh, you know, being in Europe, of course, and at the center of Europe, sort of, uh, I think that's why uh, that particular person uh, approached me. But of course, everything is under the auspices uh, now of uh, the Media Wiki stakeholder group, and we're there, you know, together with all those members in. Um, in talks and i i wouldn't even be the local chair because there's several people in paris already that uh, would take over that uh, that function but let's say yeah right. i'm a i'm sort of a moderator between an intercontinental moderator <laughs> very good um so um so i guess regardless of what your involvement is uh or, or when exactly it happens um there's always the question of of whether it'll be called SMWCon or EMWCon, uh, Semantic Media Wiki or Enterprise Media Conference. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I guess um, we'll s keep it SMWCon since this seems to be sort of the European version of uh, of our gatherings. Well, if it were up to you, what do you, do you have a preference as to the name? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm Harp I'm much it. more concerned about the content and the uh, the people and uh, the great time and we have and and the great turnouts and uh, conclusions uh, rather than the name. Well said. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's great. Uh, I I I don't know if, the, if there's anything else you want to. Uh, to talk about or mention i think we covered a lot but yeah i think uh no i i think that uh, that more or less uh, sums everything up and i would be happy to seeing everyone that listens uh at our one of our next conferences fantastic uh uh great on that note um i think that concludes the episode thanks a lot lex for coming on Thank you. And this has been another episode of Between the Brackets. I want to again thank my guest Lex Seltzer of Data Specs. And thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.